So it's great to be back at DLD, and uh, it's my privilege, together with Isabel, who you'll meet in a moment, to introduce four young entrepreneurs who um, the DLD family has chosen to showcase for you today. And, and there isn't a sort of unifying theme to what they're doing, but each of them in a dis different sphere, different geography, is doing something that we think is very important. So first up, I'd like to introduce Rina Onur from Turkey. She's a two-time serial entrepreneur. Her first company, Peak Games, is very successful in mobile gaming. The second one, Flat for Day, is a home away type of rental business that's also very successful in the Middle East. Rina. So just to introduce how we're going to do this, we have four different entrepreneurs that are going to present. It's going to be sort of a little bit conversational in style. They're each going to present their business for four to five minutes, in some cases with slides, in some cases without just talking to you. And then I'll ask some questions, and one or two of you may have the opportunity to ask some questions too. And then Isabel's going to come on and do the same with uh, a couple of the entrepreneurs in a moment. So over to you, Rena. Um, hi, everyone. Um, one of the lazy ones with no slides, I guess. Um, thanks for staying so late and coming out to hear us um, talk about our meager experiences regarding our companies. I don't know if you've felt this way, but listening to everyone talk uh, for the past two days, um, hearing people send satellites into space and driverless cars and machines um, replacing humans, I feel really underqualified. Um, and it changes my perspective about innovation. And hearing ways reaching a billion dollars in, in, in one, one and a half years, it's, it, it doesn't help. Um, but at the same time, I, I think about where I come from. I'm born and raised in Turkey. Um, both companies that I founded were headquartered in Istanbul in Turkey. And I, if I ask this audience, I think um, very few of you can name 20 companies off the top of your heads from Europe that have had a um, global impact. So I think it's safe to accept the fact that we have to learn how to walk before we can sprint. So with both of my companies, Peak Games and then um, Flat for a Day, whenever press talked about us, they talked about us as um, Zynga of the Middle East or Airbnb of Turkey and even Simon um, referred to us as home away of our region. Forgive me. No, I completely understand the reasoning behind it uh, because it's um, such a simple way of conveying what we do and how we differentiate ourselves by saying we're focused on Turkish and Arabic speaking market. Um, but I kind of applaud this as well because with Flat for a Day especially, and we looked at our market and realized that Turkey consistently have been in one of the top five visited countries in terms of tourists um, over the past 10 years. Um, 50 million people um, staying in lodgings, BMBs, and guest houses, and the number of people that come to Turkey increasing at a rate that's twice the size of hotel bed capacity increase. Um, so there was a problem, yes there was, and some people in the valley had come up with a very nice solution to that. And it wasn't their idea. Um, Airbnb is the poster child, the love baby of the sharing economy in terms of vacation rentals. But HomeAway is going to celebrate its 10 years this year. VRBO, Flipkey, these guys have been doing the same thing you know, years before, and no one called the Airbnb a copycat. So I actually feel honored when someone calls me a clone of something, um, because I'm from the school of thought that we have to start from somewhere. The initial team at Peak Games, my first company, um, they're doing great things. One of my co-founders is actually leading one of the largest e-commerce companies in Turkey. Our earlier employees have gone on to do bigger and better things. Um, so by getting inspired from ideas abroad and adapting it to our regions, um, I think there's a level of innovation there. Uh, but most importantly, it gives us the experience to do the next thing. And if I can ask a couple of questions, one of the things that Bill Gross just was speaking about was the importance of mobile and that platform becoming pervasive. Is that something that you've seen in Turkey and the Middle East in, in, in your business? So how much of your two companies are mobile versus desktop? And, yeah. Uh, 
Uh, so with PCAMES, we started entirely on um, desktop, so browser. Um, our games were denominated on Facebook. And in two years, in our second year, we had to pivot the business so that uh, immediately, uh, within six months, about 60% of our revenues were coming from mobile. So this is happening, especially in emerging markets, because in a lot of these company, countries, um, people's first experience with internet is through their smartphones. So before having wireless at their homes, um, they have the possibility um, to buy these you know, smart devices, uh, less than $100 each, in the case of Xiaomi, and be able to connect to internet and use all of these services like games or vacation rentals or anything else um, from their tablets or phones. And from the point of view of payments in Turkey and some of these other countries, how mature are the infrastructure? Do people typically kind of in, in flat yeah. for day, do they pick up the phone and sort of finish with a credit card or they put it in on their phone? How, how does that work? Um, so in terms of payment processing, Turkey is one of the um, lucky countries, I right. think. Um, Turkey has the second number, absolute number of credit cards in Europe. Okay. So after Germany, we have the highest number of credit cards. So that's, that's pretty impressive, about 46 million. But when you go to the Middle East, and it's 400 million people, an extremely underpenetrated market in every industry you can imagine, and there's a payment problem right there. Not a lot of people have credit cards. Not many people even have bank accounts. Um, so you have to develop um, you know, creative methods of being able to procure payment from people who want to spend money but don't know how. And how much of your uh, traffic are you seeing sort of indigenously from those regions versus from folks, say, overseas, which might be Turks or other Arabs living in other parts of the world sort of interacting with your services? So with the travel business, the bread and butter of the audience is basically locals traveling locally. Uh, we're slowly trying to distribute the properties um, internationally because there's incredible demand from outside to our region. But with the gaming, uh, we started very much um, locally as well, but because it's more of a product uh, than a service, it was easier to scale it internationally. Uh, so um, basically in our second, third year, about 40% of the traffic was outside of the region. That's huge. So just very quickly, I think we've probably got time for one question from the audience. Does anyone have a question for Rena? Go on, <laughs> don't be shy. Okay. Oh, we do, we got one. Sir, if you could speak loudly or wait for the mic actually might be better. Simple question. Uh, I was just wondering how you solve payment if you don't have any credit cards with a couple of your customers. Um, so basically, it was a bigger problem with the travel industry because the average ticket size is much bigger compared to microtransactions in a game. Um, people might need to be able to pay like $500 at a time. So what we did was we knew people had cash, but no way to transfer. Um, so we were actually um, integrating our software with the physical travel agencies in the Middle Eastern countries. So people could actually show up at a travel agency, give them the money, and then the corporation would wire us the money for that transaction at certain intervals. Thank you very much, Rina. Thank you so much. So next is uh, Herman Narula. Herman's a young British entrepreneur. He's a first-time entrepreneur, a graduate of uh, my alma mater, Cambridge University. His company is called Improbable. Uh, it's a, a new technology platform that's aiming to disrupt the games industry. It's in stealth mode right now, so unfortunately he can't kind of demo anything, and some of what he's going to say is a little oblique, perhaps, in, until he's fully ready to unveil himself uh, and, and improbable later this year. But Herman, please join us. Hello. Hello. Hello, hello. Yes. Thank, Thank you, Simon, there. for that good. Uh, wonderful introduction. Um, and the reference to me unveiling myself was also uh, <laughs> wonderful. So, <laughs> um, I, the thing about Improbable and, and being here is that we kind of feel like outsiders in a place like this. 
a lot of the virtues that have gone into the development of the great tech companies for the last few years, like simplicity and focus and clarity, are very hard virtues to maintain when you're trying to build fundamental technology, uh, especially technology that requires uh, an enormous investment of time and money and people. Um, and the idea behind Improbable was very simple. Uh, we wanted to create worlds. Uh, spaces in which we could create massive simulations um, with an aim to changing the kind of experiences people can have in gaming, but perhaps other things as well. Um, so the journey has been very different to traditional startups. Um, it's almost been more like an academic journey. Uh, out of Cambridge, we managed to grab first our friends, then our supervisors, then perhaps some of our professors as well. And the path to building something in isolation is very challenging and very difficult. It's very hard to remain focused. Uh, we're quite excited about finally having products emerging this year based upon our technology. But there's also a kind of anticipation and fear because whenever you make such a big bet um, of your time and your effort on one thing, you always wonder whether the change you foresee is really possible. So um, the company's name Improbable, I guess, is a reference to that fear. Um, and we're excited to see what the year brings. And so one of the things that um, you were comfortable sharing was that you've already, in 18 months, grown to 50 people, which is you know, a lot for a, a stealth startup that hasn't yet launched. T tell us about how you hired those people? How many of them are your friends? How many of them are your friends' friends? Like, how, how did you go about assembling that group, and what were the biggest challenges? So, we had a serious problem. Uh, we wanted to attract some of the best distributed systems challenge in the world, and we couldn't show them much. And we had to get their attention from major companies like Google and Microsoft. So, we found we had to kind of wage a bit of a talent guerrilla war to achieve that. Um, we sent mysterious packages. Uh, we would <laughs> interact with people in all kinds of things, online games, other spaces, academic conferences. And we ended up being a sort of uh, a bit of a hidden secret among certain people in the fields we were interested in. And gradually, our ideas kind of spread that way. And it became a little talent call, which, which grew our team. And it also attracted funding as well. And I guess when you look at the different ways that people use games today. Obviously, you know, what, what you're working on is very transformative, but can you give folks a sort of insight of different inspirations that you had that might be existing games, or it might be something in science fiction that you've read, or? Sure, I mean, the, the principle behind what we want to enable is that I guess most games today are canned content. Uh, you have an experience, and then that experience is disposed of. However, there are some things you see in the industry, games like DayZ, which you may be familiar with, and uh, in online spaces like Second Life, in which the fun doesn't come from canned content. It comes from these emergent experiences that people have. I guess we wanted to follow that idea to its natural conclusion, which led us down the road of considering simulation at enormous scale. And just to understand, so Improbable is a technology platform. Why did you make the decision to build the platform like that and, and not, say, build your own games on top of that as well? Well, uh, what little press there is about us is about how many game developers we've recently attracted. All so, right, so you've attracted we... <laughs> lots of other developers, but I guess the question is, what? sometimes when you build a new platform, that there's a fashion to vertically integrate and also build the applications. I won't say all of them, but one or two of them, just like, you know, when Apple launched this, there was, you know, their own, uh, camera and you know one or two other applications they built as well as Google Maps and other things on it. So just how did you think about that? So actually, uh, we'd agree. Um, early on, we began very close relationships with customers to the point where we were basically co-developing some of the first products that are coming out this year. Um, and we've announced some of those relationships elsewhere. But in our case, we were able to maintain such close relationships with them that we were riffing together. Oh, that's, that's great. So any questions from the audience for uh, Herman and Improbable, which I realize you know, that some of what we've talked about is a little abstract, but <laughs> nonetheless, very exciting. What do, you, what do you do to attract the best talent? We give them really, really hard problems. Um, we, we pretty much sell them out on joining Improbable. Um, we spend a lot of time devising challenges, some of which are impossible <laughs> in our interview process. Um, and it's often about that excitement, that intellectual excitement of working on what we work on. 
w one more, and then I, I'm afraid we have to wrap up. Any, any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much, Herman. Thanks. First of all, thank you, Simon. Um, Pleasure. Now the, the Germans are coming. <laughs> uh, our next moderator is the Chair for Strategy and Organization at the Technical University in Munich, Isabel Weipe. Welcome. Hello. Uh, great to, to be back at DLD. I have the honor to introduce two entrepreneurs. I'll start with Frank. But first, a question to you, the audience. How many of you write texts of some sort? Oh, almost all of you. Well, Frank has started a company that says, let us do the writing for you. Wouldn't that be something? Instead of you doing the writing, have his company do the writing? So I have the honor to introduce Frank Fellner, who is the CTO of AX Semantics, a company that does automated text generation. So Frank doesn't have a tech background. He studied German philology and political science, but is the CTO of AX Semantics today. Frank, welcome on stage. Good evening, everybody, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. So, Frank, I understand you have a, a small presentation prepared? Yes, actually, being a CTO, I was um, kind of eager to show you how the solution actually works and um, what you could imagine if you um, are confronted with automated content or a natural language generation application. Um, actually, how do I flip uh, the slides? <laughs> okay, well, I'll fill okay. in with questions in the meantime. Now, Frank, how does one end up as a journalist and a writer at the technical lead at a big tech company? Well, actually, um, that is a funny story because um, when I joined the company Exea, which is the home of AX Semantics and the whole product line, um, the company was actually focused on manually producing quality content, really high quality content at high prices. And um, around 2008, 2009, um, crowdsourcing and cheap and mass content um, providers were literally storming the market and pushing down prices. Um, so we thought, okay, we aren't many, we can't crowdsource anything, but we can counter um, by using technology. So that is basically where AX Semantics started oh. out. Oh, interesting. So, All right. you have the presenter. <laughs> so meanwhile, I do have a presenter. And I've prepared something for you that is supposed to show you um, how a natural language generation application is intelligent and how it automatically uh, generates content and text and actual speech from data, because that is what the application is actually doing. So this is the quiet state. First thing that the application needs to have is connection and access to a database um, and some additional information on what information it is to find inside the database. Given that, the second thing it needs is an impulse, like for example, a customer requesting a text or a news event happening and being transported into the algorithm by, for example, RSS or an API or whatever sort of thing. What it then does is quite interesting because there it gets really intelligent. Um, what it does is assess the data and categorize it. For example, what patterns are there in the data, what thing or what type of event uh, the data set is talking about, or even how does the data set compare to similar data sets and what is new and dramatic about this specific event. Um, funny thing is, um, this happens without connection to actual speech. It's a purely semantic model of a data set, which enables us to be quite flexible in the next step yeah, which is connecting the semantic image of the data set um, to a grammar complex of any given language. So um, you have an abstract depiction of what the data conveys in information and how the text is supposed to look, and then you project it into any given language that we have trained grammar for. Um, what comes out then is logically a text at the moment. Um, 
which also includes meta text. It could be an HTML text, it could be cutting directions for a video or even program code. Um, and that is also in the scope of actual applications uh, for the software right now. So, um, <laughs> I also brought you some slides on general difficulties because um, there are some paradigms that we are really throwing effort into at the moment and that we are seeing at um, the basic challenges um, that NLG is facing until um, the reader experience is superb. Actually, I'm seeing two great trends which are starting to be tackled in the NLG scene, one of which is the circumstance that machines don't have a social nature by themselves. Because a machine didn't go to school, a machine doesn't have friends in the first place, so it's not socialized and therefore has difficulties assessing, for example, soft and cultural effects. It would be difficult for a machine to say why somebody prints Je suis Charlie on a t-shirt, for example. Um, an approach in which we are trying to tackle this problem is providing the machine with world knowledge or semantic knowledge. Um, basically connecting it to, to any kind of available data and establishing um, connections between the, the particular points in data and between any point in data. I'll show you a slide on how that works in detail later on. Um, <laughs> building up world knowledge on a great stack of interconnecting knowledge gets you to another challenge which we are currently throwing massive effort into, and that is <laughs> ironic right now because I'm talking very much myself, um, keeping the machine relevant, telling it when to stop, um, given an almost abundant amount of information on any given topic. So, what is world knowledge? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, to explain what world knowledge is and why it is relevant or could be the next big thing in NLG, um, I brought you the example of a football game between two German clubs Stuttgart and Hoffenheim. If somebody, and that is actually possible at the moment, um, requested a text from our software about this game, um, the first thing the software would do is go and query all the available APIs on what to find out about the game. It might even do that recursively, so the amount of data you end up with after a few rounds looks like this. There is green data about the game itself, for example, the outcome, the place, the date, etc. But there is also peripheral data that is um, further and more distant from the original scope of the game. Like, for example, the game has participants, they are football clubs, but they consist of persons who all come with their own amount of data. Until you end up with something like this. Sven Ulreich, damn you ought to correct, um, <laughs> actually turns up two data points which are really relevant for him. First, being married to a model, and second, having rescued a cute little dog. The question is, this information is available at hand and the machine is able to text about it, um, but a really big challenge is, how do we keep it from texting about it when it is supposed to text originally about a football game? So, given that the machine is able to do so, there are applications which are actually running at the moment in the following fields. Um, as you can see, whether sports, finance, and marketing are really data and number-driven fields of application. And if you look at the text types that are being currently realized in those fields, you see that the trend and possibly the additional value of the solution is that you can text very individual and personal forms of texts, given that also user data is available in addition to, for example, game data or meteorologic data or even product data. Everything can be personalized, and because text stemming from an algorithm is cheap, it is also viable. It is also a possible strategy for, for example, e-commerce or publishing players to do so and to enhance user experience by personalizing. So briefly, what is the future and where does that lead us with NLG? <laughs> She's tapping her clock, so um, really briefly. Um, our postulate is basically that um, automation is going to be available in short time for pretty much anybody to use. Um, I would say that the company that is able to provide an end-user solution for NLG is probably the one that's going to make the race. Um, another trend 
which may be quite provoking is um, that I say that big data is going to be upgraded or replaced to or by semantic data, data in context, data with additional knowledge. Um, interesting, because this is border, how would that affect anybody who is currently writing texts? In my imagination, as many skeptics, or as opposed to what many skeptics may say, um, the newsroom of the future is not going to lack humans. On the contrary, those humans who, who will be producing content in the future will be able to cover a much broader scope by using computer assistance. The content that is being produced by humans is going to be premium because they can invest time and they can um, put real effort in, in content quality, in research and in all their strongholds without being distracted by recurring and repetitive tasks like, for example, um, I don't know, like, for example, a, a, a event schedule or something that is present in every newspaper and nobody likes to write. Um, additionally, the scope is also being um, enhanced by, by um, the ability of machines to uh, draw new insights from data that are probably not visible to the naked eye. Like if you imagine a stock report, for example, for a day, that is a whole lot of numbers which are not quite intuitive to read. So, <laughs> to cut it short, because time is really running out, this is what the machine is actually producing at the moment. This is once um, a report on the price of aluminium and its development over a day, and an actual product um, for football. It's a game announcement and uh, also a game review. And that is something you can already obtain from an existing machine. Very good. Thank you, Thank Frank. You. So, t time for a, for a few questions and clarification. So, in, in one sentence, Frank, what's your vision slash strategic goal? Well, one sentence. <laughs> I guess I can do it in a half sentence because it's automation for everyone. Automation for everyone. Okay, next yeah. question. Which professions? are safe from your software and your company? <laughs> CTO, I guess. Um, <laughs> no. Actually, I don't see a drastic impact because machines are doing baby steps in becoming intelligent, but are way away from being autonomous in a Skynet way. Okay. They're not going to replace humans, but instead help them. That's my vision. Have you done tests? Can readers actually tell the difference if a text has been generated by you or by a journalist? Um, unfortunately not, okay. <laughs> which leaves us with a great deal of responsibility. Um, okay, how do you deal with creativity? How are we doing on the creative side? Actually, our company consists of about half the personnel in editors and journalists. Um, the machine doesn't contribute original creativity, but is able to um, take creative input and reproduce it okay. rapidly and, and broadly. We even employ journalists ourselves to, to give the texts the human touch that you can, that you can realize when reading them. Okay. Well, it sounds very impressive. I would like to open up for the audience. Any questions to Frank or what the company can do? That's not the case, then I'll ask a very last question. Well, Frank, do you, I read on your web page that you often do the development on a Friday evening night drinking uh, beer. Is that true? Um, in my case, it's actually not beer, but club mate. Okay. <laughs> <But yeah. laughs> it's too bad, because I wanted to use this to introduce our next panelist. Um, so sorry. Thank you, Frank. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> And our next panelist is Katharina Kurz from Berlin. She is uh, the CEO of a startup company that deals with something we all enjoy, with craft beer. And she has prepared a little presentation and will tell you more about her young startup company. Thank you, Isabel. Yeah, so um, we're probably the only <laughs> offline startup here. Um, we're a very young startup from Berlin. And um, so the real demo is going to be tonight at the DLD party where you can enjoy as many beers as you want from us. So I'm very excited about that. Um, this is our brand. Oh. If you have no idea how to pronounce this, you're not alone. Um, and frankly, we don't really care because um, 
the most important thing is that you like our beers. Um, we pronounce it Berlo, and it's actually the old Slavic origin of the name of Berlin. But you know, we also like other versions, like Brillo is also fine, or if you want to be really fancy, you can order a Berlo, please. Um, so basically, uh, craft beer, the term originated in the US in the 80s um, because they only had like five big brewing companies and um, they produced kind of like, um, you know, yellow colored water um, that smelled and tasted exactly how it sounds. Um, so out of necessity, um, you know, young like hobby brewers um, really started experimenting and creating really cool new beer styles. So craft beer um, means handcrafted, passionate beers, um, it means experimenting with new styles or even ingredients and the people and the stories behind the beer, they really matter. And this brings an exciting new diversity to beer. And um, before you say, how dare you in the beer country of Germany, like even in Germany, we need new diversity to beer because there's more to it than just pills and Hefeweizen and advertising geared to guys watching football. Um, so... Uh, this, uh, this is us, so we're three founders, and if you want to do a little bit of stereotyping, people always think the guy with the beard is the brewer. So this is Christian, my co-founder, he's not. <laughs> um, he also has a tech uh, background like me, so for us it's been actually amazing to move to a handcrafted product. It's been really nice to order raw materials and, and organize a production. The guy in the middle is the brewer, so he actually um, you know, knows how to really produce it. Um, uh, the nice thing is that so Berlo is really our interpretation of a contemporary beer brand and it's great because it really um, combines um, the vision and kind of elements of, of the three founders. For example, for me, you know, uh, the design aspect was really important and I really wanted those hearts in there. Um, and then for, for Michael, the, the brewmaster obviously was all about the product. So uh, we only use organic malt, we know our suppliers personally, we only work with small companies, so this was really important. And for Christian, um, it was all about sus uh, sustainability. So, you know, we're rooted in Berlin. Um, we donate five cents of every beer sold to social initiatives in Berlin. Um, and so Christian is also the, the chief esoteric guy uh, on our team. So we actually energize our brewing water, uh, which means we take 50 <laughs> kilograms of gemstones and crystals <laughs> and put it in the brewing water, <laughs> uh, and then, um, you know, before it's being brewed for a few hours so that you can feel really, really amazing when you do it. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so just to finish up, we have, so these are the actual bottles. We have two beer styles out right now. Uh, a nice Berlin interpretation of a Helles. So I'm really excited to, to see what uh, everybody from Munich thinks about that, and a wonderful pale ale, so you can have as many as you want um, tonight. And um, yeah, we're super excited about that. And um, um, I want to, you know, end with a, these words, save the planet, it's the only one with beer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the talk and also thank you for sponsoring drinks tonight. We're all looking forward to that. Uh, Katarina, I was wondering, Coca-Cola has made a public statement saying how digital technology shapes its business model. Is uh, Berlo actually a tech company? Well, I mean, I jokingly said we're an offline company, but obviously, you know, uh, only in the sense that we make an actual product and we sell it to bars and restaurants, but you can't exist as a brand today and, and not being digital. So obviously, and especially because we first try to establish a local brand in Berlin and then expand from there. This is usually important, um, everything that's on Facebook and Instagram, and we're trying to you know, get bloggers to write about it. Um, the craft beer scene is hugely social, mm -hmm. so there are these like, apps, like it's called Untapped, and people go to a bar and whenever they drink a beer, they check in and they check in at the bar and they check in the beer and they rate it right away. And this is like a really big thing in the scene. So you have to be completely in tune. And we also approach it, I think, like a, like a digital startup. And, um, you know, we obviously we, we sell our beers online. Um, and, you know, yeah, so that's what we do. I also read that you 
selectively support social projects? Mm -hmm. Why, as a young startup, is that important to you? Have you decided to do that? And how do you select them? Yeah, um, for us it's really important because uh, we feel part of, of the Berlin community. And um, as I said, sustainability is really important for us from the raw materials, from the partners we brew with. And this also for us is really, you know, giving back to Berlin. and, and, and um, so for us, this was really clear right from the beginning that we're going to do this. Um, how we selected? Um, so for the first project we were working with is called the Kulturloge, which basically um, gives cultural tickets like concerts and theater to people from low income classes. So for us, the projects that we select are kind of like more in the culture um, realm or um, everything that is ecological. So the next one is probably going to be an urban gardening project. Mm -hmm. Nice. <laughs> What do you look for in applications you might get? Um, uh, well, you know, I mean, we had no clue about brewing beer, uh, like <laughs> probably eight months ago. So um, you don't necessarily have to know a lot about the thing, but you have to be really, really passionate about okay. it. Um, so I hope we're going to grow. Um, we're going to grow soon, you know, right now we're concentrating on Berlin, but we do obviously have plans to go to other cities. And um, so I think that's the most important thing, passion, being passionate about what you do. Okay. And a year from now, what do you think, where will you be, what will you do? Um, I hope that we're going to be one of the, the most well-known craft beer brands in Germany. So that's for sure. So not only in Berlin. Okay. Well, from the audience, other questions to Katharina and her Berlo beer? Yes, we have one question there, and I think one in the back. Where? Ah, that's um, right now, we started two months ago, so this is really, really new. Um, right now, we, we sell it all over Berlin, in restaurants, in bars, in, in like small selective retail shops. So for us, it's really important to build up the brand. Um, and we very selectively sponsor events. Uh, and I mean, like I said, we're super happy to, to be here and have this opportunity. We also sell online. Um, you know, with beer, um, the, the really crucial factor is distribution um, it, and logistics. Um, so this is actually a really complex business because you have this, you know, huge, um, I don't know, weight and, and, and big crate which is gone in 10 minutes. So um, organ and at a low price. So organizing distribution is really crucial and we need partners in different cities and I think for that you first have to build up a brand that gets traction in a, in a single market so that's um, what we're trying to do. Yes, Anna. Did the existing beer brands react in some way? Is that the question? Okay. They, they haven't called us yet. You mean craft <laughs> beer or the big companies? Um, I mean, I think um, uh, the craft beer trend is really starting now in Germany, so um, the, the big companies are definite, do definitely have an eye on it. I think in terms of numbers, it's not relevant for them yet, but they definitely see that um, there is a huge change in, in consumer behavior because, like I said, I think the, the beer market in Germany has really been lacking diversity. I mean, of course, there are like 2,000 breweries, but they all kind of do the same beer styles. They're all very, very traditional. And so I think they're going to start um, seeing that in a few years. In the US, for example, this year, craft beer overtook, well, I mean, all the craft beer brands overtook Budweiser consumption for the first time um, this year, which was actually a huge number. So craft beer in the US is now at 25% market share. Um, so I think it's going to take a little while, and obviously the baseline, the quality of beer in Germany is a lot better than it used to, well, it's great um, than it used to be in the US, but I think the big companies are going to react to that soon. Okay. Thank you all. Do we have time for a last question? Yeah, one last question. Very good question. It really started off as a super crazy idea. Um, I knew craft beer from, from living abroad, and I always just loved being in a bar and trying out the different beers, and the labels were creative, and people were so passionate about trying different things. And I thought that would be so cool to do a little cool beer brand at some point. Um, and then, so, so Christian and I, we studied together, uh, and we had this night where we had a lot of beers, and it turned out that we both wanted to do something with beer. <laughs> at some point in our lives. 
And you know what? That's how it started. And then um, we, we started looking for a brewmaster because we knew, you know what, there's no use like trying to learn this ourselves. And we found this young guy, 26 years old, who has been brewing since he was 16 and really wanted to go off on his own. And I think that was really crucial for us because we didn't want to do just like a marketing thing where we create the brand and then we just pay somebody. Um, but it was really important that we do this as a team and, and, and found this as a team. So he is, you know, a, a real co-founder and he's a crucial part of this. So it, it started off as a crazy idea. Um, but like I said, it's, it's really satisfying to, to create a real product and share it with your friends and, and beer is a great example for that. <laughs> All right, if you're curious, come to the party and try it tonight. Thank you, Katharina. Thank you. Thank you all.